study of inscriptions is known as epigraphy okay study of inscriptions is known as hmm? say lovely okay perfection the number of times you repeat the more perfection you will get okay so study of old writings is known as paleo graphic who is the only first and last ruler to issue the edicts also known as rajagnas ashoka dated back to 3rd century bc i told you the earliest deciphered inscriptions in india are whose inscriptions the earliest deciphered that is the first deciphered inscriptions in india are in india is the ashoka inscription dated back to 3rd century bc who are the first to issue inscriptions indus valley people harappan people are the first to issue inscriptions but they are unable to decode that is the reason they are undeciphered that is that is unable to understand the main reason is they have the script of pictographic consisting of pictures we are able to understand what is the picture meaning it may be i told you it may be a sound an idea an object because every language is consisting of what alphabets words sentences and phrases but the point is ivc script is pictography consisting of pictures which is the first language used to issue the inscriptions prakrit prakrit is the first language used dated back to 3rd century bc next language is sanskrit in the second century ad and the regional languages is is when 9th century ad so please remember the chronological order remember the chronological order okay so the study of coins is known as numis matics okay give me an example for the land charters which is one of the type of you know inscriptions pune copper plate inscription issued by prabhavati gupta who is the daughter of chandragupta to belongs to guptan dynasty so i told you the majority of the copper plate inscriptions are issued for the land charters land charters are also known as dhana shasanas land donation give me an example for the prashasti inscription samudra guptas allahabad inscription what are prashastis which are also known as eulogies what are prashastis the prashastis is one of the type of inscriptions which is consisting of the information of about their wars victories titles glorifications so praising themselves they are known as prashastis the name itself is indicating prashasti that means what praising themselves bharat shri nodal Pro bharat shri project implemented by which nodal agency which nodal it is the ministry which is the nodal agency to implement i didn't told yesterday that is the reason you are not saying whatever the issue regarding the archaeological sources which is the designated body yes sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. simple regarding the archaeological sources the sole designated authority is asi so asi is the sole nodal agency for the bharat shri project of course which is also under the ministry of ministry of culture what is the target 1 lakh inscriptions so bharat shri bharat shri project is what is the full form of bharat shri bharat shri bharat shared repository of i means inscriptions inscriptions the target is 1 lakh inscriptions will be created as digital epigraphic museums epigraphy is nothing but study of inscriptions okay so where is the headquarters set up for the bharat shri hyderabad hyderabad is the only headquarter i mean to say hyderabad is the only center for the bharat shri project so i told you the sources to study the history is divided into two types one is archaeological sources which we finished in the last class 
so in this class we are going to study about the second type of sources to study about the past those are known as what next type is literary sources literary sources literary sources also known as what historical sources also known as historical sources this is actual history because the last class we discuss about the archaeological sources is the cup of tea of the only archaeologist they worried about the material remains what they found based upon the findings they studied the history but the historians duty is yes they study also about the past but the point is through the written records written records are the only source for the historians to study about the past they studied the past through these records and they will reframe the history they will restructure their history in a systematic way organized way in a chronological way one event next event first dynasty next dynasty replaced with other dynasty replaced with other dynasty that's how they will arrange the history in a chronological ascending way to make understand the people easily so the written records are the only source so historians duty is not about the worrying about the material remains of pottery coins inscriptions okay they only worried about the written records and the written records based are the sources for the historians that is the reason these sources are known as historical sources also known as literary sources okay so i told you for the archaeological sources which is the nodal agency sole designated authority yes yes sir but for these sources which is also worried about the only written records the nodal agency to deal with the syllabus everything is indian council of historical research indian council of historical research indian council of historical research is the body which frame the syllabus for the academies whether it is school syllabus whether it is college syllabus whether it is ssc syllabus staff selection commission syllabus whether it is upsc syllabus also so what is the syllabus should be included in the curriculum academy or any kind of exams so this is the body which actually identifies ratifies the subject then only it is included in the syllabus for example you are worrying about the neutrinos which is a science particle recently discovered by some of the scientists so it is rated by the indian scientist and the government scientist which is the sole body and they will ratify the subject and everything and they will suggest to the government because those are the body to suggest the curriculum academy regarding the subject then only it is included in the curriculum in the same manner whatever the thing regarding the history this is the body which ratifies which certifies the subject then it is included in the syllabus regarding the school syllabus of ncert regarding the degree or regarding the any including the upsc also so it is also maintain regarding the curriculum curriculum but also it means in the matters record matters record that means what the persons who sacrificed their life during the freedom struggle so who are the freedom fighters list is maintained by the indian council of historical research the overall point which i want to make here is indian council of historical research is the body in india which deals with the historical cases about the persons ratifying about the persons list who are matured during the freedom fighting and next thing is about the subject which should be ratified which should be included in the syllabus in the center or everything so this indian council of historical research is the designated body regarding the historical records okay but the point here is it is a society under the government it is not a statutory body it is not an executive body it is registered as a society of course but it is an autonomous organization okay i am talking of indian council of historical research which is registered as a society under the government indian societies act 
and which is a autonomous body which is a autonomous body okay and the point here is this indian council of historical research is comes under the ministry of not culture it comes under the ministry of education it comes under the ministry of education please remember indian archaeological survey of india comes under the ministry of culture you are preparing for upsc don't write each and everything only only the required key points should be read and we should be memorized don't write the silly things okay archaeological survey of india comes under ministry of culture but indian council of historical research comes under ministry of education it comes under ministry of education okay so this is the body to deal with the written records of the historical sources okay let's study about the second sources that is literary sources so literary sources are nothing but what written records and these records are divided into two types one is indigenous accounts which are also known as native accounts which are also known as native accounts and next one is obviously the foreign accounts foreign accounts so simply speaking based upon the written written by the person indigenous accounts means what these records these writings are nothing but they are written by whom by indians indian scholars indian tourists indian people indian ambassadors those are the people who written the records these records are written by the indians nothing but native native means what indians also known as indigenous that means they are the people belongs to india indian subcontinent what meaning of the foreign accounts foreign accounts means what they are written by the records written by the foreigners okay so these let's discuss about one by one that is indigenous accounts also known as native accounts also known as native accounts indigenous accounts also known as native accounts again this indigenous accounts the native accounts are again divided into two types two types one is religious text and next is secular text secular text also known as what non religious text this classification is based on the content which the book is consisting if a book is consisting of the majority of the information about the religion those text is known as religious text if the book contains a very very microscopic minority information regarding the religion and majorly worrying about majorly giving the information about the political social cultural legal issues such kind of book is known as such kind of record is known as secular text secular means what nothing worried about the religion that is the point the secular text is also known as non religious text this classification i repeat once again based upon the information the book which it consist if the book is majorly dealing with the religious issues it is known as religious text if the book is majorly giving the information about the social history political history legal history okay economic history such kind of text is known as secular text okay so this classification is under what under the indigenous accounts native accounts okay so let's discuss about the the first one that is religious text religious text what is religious text i told you the religious text is nothing but dealing with 
majorly religion these text majorly dealing with the religion for example you take bhagavad gita you take ramayana okay so the bhagavad gita given the information about the gods the genealogy the gods and everything and all even if you take ramayana also dealing with the majorly religion hindu dharma and all but don't forget that it also gives the some kind of little information regarding the society that means what at least the position of women in an indirect way at least about the patriarchal society because even in the ramayana mahabharata who are the rulers male male or female male nothing but it is indicating even in the ancient days also you have the patriarchal society what is patriarchy male dominated society is known as patriarchal if it is female dominated is matriarchal the example is kerala kerala is majorly is matriarchal that means what may women dominated generally in the rest of india in the rest of the world also the major society is patriarchal patriarchy means what the male dominated society that means the important crucial decisions are taken by the male father in a family in the society so that means what even though the book consisting of social issues political issues economic histories but the point here is the content is very less but the book is majorly dealing with what religious issues such a kind of text is known as religious text for example if you take the vedic literature the vedic literature even you can name it as a, it is also known as brahmanical literature brahmanical literature okay so vedic literature is also named as brahmanical literature why because the literature is majorly majorly composed by the brahmana people that is the reason vedic religion is also known as brahmanical religion in the same manner vedic text is also known as brahmanical text it is it is an official word you can name it in the even in the paper also mains paper also this is an official word but the point is what this vedic religion is majorly discuss about the religion about the natural gods about the indra varuna brahma parameshwara rituals yagnas yagas about this so the content is majorly discussing about the religion which kind of religion vedic religion and it gives a small very 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 little information about the socio political and economic history but major content is dealing with the religion in the next is about obviously the jain literature literature majorly giving the information of which religion jainism next buddhist text buddhist text that means what buddhist literature that means what this literature is majorly giving the information of which religion buddhism so these are the examples for the religious text within the indigenous account but the point here is the indians literature indians literature started with started with religious literature only okay the indians first literature is majorly dealt by religion so indians majorly worried about the religion and the major thing is they compose it on the books so the earliest literature is majorly composed on the religion especially about the vedic religion that is the reason if i talk about the earliest literature earliest books of india rigveda yajurveda samaveda adharanaveda upanishads vedangas itihasas ramayana mahabharata what does all means they are all 99.99% consisting the information about yagnas yagas rituals and especially about the even the gods so the earliest literature of india the starting literature of india is majorly composed of religion only the very very important point of this class is the first text the first text that is the first that is what earliest text book composed in india is rigveda 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 is the first earliest text the first literary tradition write down one statement the first 
a literary tradition the first literary tradition the first literary tradition in india write down in the bracket indian subcontinent the first literary tradition in india indian sub subcontinent starts with rigveda underline the first literary tradition in india write down in the bracket indian subcontinent starts with rigveda okay so rigveda is the earliest first book composed in india the first book in india composed is rigveda okay i will tell you this rigveda is dated back to 1500 to 1000 bc this rigveda is dated back to the time period of rigveda composed is 1500 to 1000 bc and it is composed in the language sanskrit it is composed in the language sanskrit and don't ask me who composed it because the person who is responsible for this rigveda is we don't know and one more important thing which i want to mention here is it is not composed by a single person so that is the reason if you search also you don't get okay rigveda is the earliest first book no doubt it is an absolute undisputed unbiased fact no doubt it is everybody should accept and it is written in sanskrit dated back to 1500 to 1000 bc but the point here is it is not written by a single person and we don't know who even wrote it okay next thing is after religious literature next one is secular literature secular literature you can also name it as what non religious literature you can also name it as non religious literature so the key is what simple that means they deal with the religion is very less they majorly focus on what kind of history they give they give the social they give the social history political history and economic history our code of laws okay but very less focus on religion okay very less focus on religion they give the major information about the social history political history economic history code of laws and etc code of laws and etc so they give this is the very useful content regarding because they give the political history social history so why studying this books you will get the information what is the status of varna which is the upper varna which is the lower varna and how the woman position is whether she is respected whether she is allowed for the education and all whether she is allowed for the work and what is the status of the society what is the trade and commerce and what are what type of coins they issued whether the trace the state treasury is whether filthy rich or not wealthy or not according to the coins they issued you can easily assess the the wealth of the particular dynasty if somebody issued gold coins you can easily say they may have they may their state treasury might have rich that is the reason they might have issued the gold coins so that is the they throw light on the socio political economic history so that is the reason they are much helpful and the best example for this secular literature is rigveda sorry ashtadhyay ashtadhyay which is written by the panini panini wrote ashtadhyay book in 450 bc which is dated back to 450 bc and it is a treatise on sanskrit that is what this ashtadhyay is a sanskrit grammar book it is a sanskrit lexicon sanskrit lexicon means what 
dictionary lexicon means dictionary not grammar so this is sanskrit lexicon which can especially dealing with what grammar so this is the first book written in the grammar so you can say easily the panini is the obviously the the first grammarian in india the first grammarian in india because he wrote which book ashtadhyayi panini wrote ashtadhyayi in 450 bc which is a sanskrit lexicon sanskrit dictionary what kind of dictionary it is a grammar dictionary it is a grammar dictionary so you can say the panini is the first grammarian in india and he is alumni from takshila university alumni from takshila university what is the meaning of alumni student okay he is educated from the takshila university the oldest university in the world the oldest university in the world is takshila university located in pakistan the meant to say the present pakistan okay so panini wrote ashtadhyayi which is a grammar book so panini can be regarded as the first grammarian in india which is dated back to 450 bc so ashtadhyayi ashta means what ashta means eight it is consisting of eight chapters dealing with the grammar that is the reason it is named as ashta adhyayi adhyaya means what chapters adhyayam first adhyayam second adhyayam third adhyayam adhyaya means what chapters how many chapters are there eight chapters are composed by a panini that is the reason it is known as ashta adhyayi eight chapters and which is dated back to 450 bc that is the reason he is credited with the tag first grammarian in india indian subcontinent and he is graduated that means what he is alumni from takshila university located in the present pakistan once part of india that is indian subcontinent so you can say that the ashtadhyayi is the first the first scientific outlook of the first scientific outlook of indians the first scientific outlook of indians is exposed in in what grammar many people think that indians discovered zero indians discovered very much knowledge in astronomy astrology but the point here is before that in 450 bc panini wrote ashtai that means what the earliest indians scientific outlook is exposed in which field grammar field grammar is also a science subject because grammar is nothing but a scientific outlook how to frame the words how to frame the everything sentences and everything so that logic you go that analysis is also a scientific outlook so the first scientific outlook of indians are exposed in which field grammar field after this many years after that astronomy astrology gravity mass algorithm and of course pythagoras also algebra and all okay if the question comes that means the first scientific outlook of indians are exposed in which field means astronomy astrology mass grammar the answer is grammar which is a science subject scientific outlook is nothing but the grammar which grammar which language grammar sanskrit grammar okay sanskrit grammar that is the reason the questions should be read efficiently and effectively you have to read only one time but the exactly the sense should be made in your mind okay grammar only what kind of grammar every language has a grammar but the panni wrote the grammar book in which which grammar sanskrit grammar why i am discussing so much about this issue is because in last year the cambridge university scholar whose name is rishi is actually solved the very very toughest puzzle of ashtadhyay in 2023 okay it is in the limelight so upsc is easily select the questions by interlinking the current affairs with the core subjects so it is in the limelight so he don't ask the direct question who is rishi which university what is no he will go to the statics so he link that that means what his intention is whether this person is dynamic or not honorable or not 
whether he is just struggling with the core subjects and he is relaxing but he is least worried about the current affairs no upsc is very particular about the current affairs i told you in the mains there is no single question comes from the core without relevance to the current affairs every question in the mains definitely you will get through the linking of current affairs if you don't write the answers in the mains without the relevance of the question of the present context definitely you will lose the half of the marks okay including history and geography also because many people think that history and geography is obviously not to dynamic because they are already written nothing going to be changed everything is same yes you are said but the point here is if a question asked regarding any kind of movement any kind of satyagraha definitely at least it is finishing about the 100 years 150 years something relevance is there so try to mention the current context relevance in the mains question so the point here is the astadhyay puzzle which is written by pani in 450 bc is solved in recently in 2023 by Cambridge University scholar whose name is Rishi. So, Ashtadhyayi is in the limelight. So, that is my, okay, that is my point. Okay, so, the Cambridge scholar solved the recent, I mean, solved the most toughest puzzle of Ashtadhyayi. Okay, and next thing is, so, that is all about the, one of the nice example. Next classification is what? After indigenous accounts. After indigenous accounts, next thing is what? foreign accounts foreign accounts it is nothing but the name itself is indicating foreign accounts is nothing but what it is written by whom by the foreigners the foreigners who visited India the foreigners who visited India. So, the foreign accounts are the nothing but the, these are the records written by the foreigners who visited India. They may be an invoice. Invoice means what? Invoice is nothing but what? Uh, ambassadors. They may be travelers. They may be merchants. Or they may be pilgrims etc so they must be a foreigner so the foreigners who came to india as envoys or travelers or merchants or pilgrims who visited india they astonished with the socio cultural customs traditions practices of india and they pinned down the whatever they are encountered in india and which gives a very very valuable information because obviously for Indians whatever the thing they are encountering from the childhood it won't get any astonishing things you won't get surprised because they are habituated if somebody came from the outside they feel very surprised because of the untouchability because of the position of women because of the caste system and that too caste system is implemented very very seriously because the judiciary, the, the judiciary work, the environment, the political, each and every position, everything is enjoyed by the upper caste people. Whereas these people are discriminated in the name of caste in each and every sphere of the society. So they are astonished and that is the reason they pin it down. Because the sati kind of thing, because after the death of her husband, she is allowed to enter into the funeral pyre of the husband when she is alive. So they are shocking. What are the things? So such a kind of very, very crucial information is provided by the foreigners. Native organs know because they are from the childhood they will encounter. How they depend on the such kind of issues? Until unless you feel something special, you write it, right? So these are the foreigners who came from the outside and they feel shocked by the socio-cultural customs and they very, very given the very crucial information in their books. And they came while they came as envoys, they came as travelers, or they came as a merchants, or they came as a pilgrims. That means what? They are the devotees of a god. Okay. So, in the name of these things, they came to India. And the examples for this is, for example, Greek records. For example, Greek records. You take a person whose name is Megasthenes.
Megasthenes. I am giving an example for the Greek records. And the person name is Megasthenes. Okay, who wrote? Who wrote? Indica. Who wrote Indica in Greek language? Hmm. Even Rigveda you don't find. Many books are not found. See, they wrote 2000 years back. I think Indica is 300 BC, 200 BC. So obviously those kind of text is actually written by the some other scholars who are in the fourth generations, in the coming generations. So by the reading that books, you can claim that, okay, this is the information regarding the Indica. And next thing is regarding the Latin records. Ah, ambassador, Megasthenes. I'm just giving, I'm not discussing about Megasthenes. My intention is regarding the foreign accounts. So he is the foreigner who wrote the book Indica in Greek language. The next thing is Latin records. Latin records. A person whose name is Pliny, who wrote Natural History. Who wrote Natural History? In which language? Latin language. Okay, I am giving the examples for the foreign accounts. Greek records, example is Megasthenes, who wrote Indica in Greek language. And the Latin records, the example is Pliny, person name. And the who wrote the book Natural History in Latin language. I'm just giving the examples, nothing else. Of course, while reading the chapters, you will find number of examples because this is the introduction. I'm giving in order to make you understand the concept. Okay, write down one statement, write down one sentence. Among the foreigners, very, very important statement. Among the foreigners, among the foreigners, Greeks were the first. Among the foreigners, among the foreigners, Greeks were the first. Greeks were the first to visit India. To visit India. Among the foreigners, the Greeks were the first to visit India. Among the foreign records. So Greeks were the first to visit India. So that is all about the indigenous accounts and the foreign accounts regarding the classification of the historical records. So you may ask me, sir, which is more reliable? If you ask me, sir, which is more reliable? That is foreign account, that means native accounts. And next is foreign accounts. So, sir, if which is more reliable? This is written by whom? Indians. And this is written by the foreigners. So, both give valuable information. But comparatively, the historians while studying the Indian account, for example, they found a book which is written in the same period. A person is Indian, a person is a foreigner. And they found the same information regarding the But the context is somebody praising the issue, somebody is degrading the issue regarding the particular issue. They belong to the same time period. They worked under the same king. And they mentioned about the same event. And the point here is, it is recorded by a foreigner. It is recorded by an Indian. I mean to say native accounts. And the same context of the situation is, he is degrading the situation, he is praising the situation. On those kind of situations, historians tilt towards which records? That means what? The reliability, the merit should be given to which records are, if you ask me. The comparatively, both are, I mean to say, both are much information. When it is comparison, the foreign accounts are much more reliable. The foreign accounts are much more reliable than the native accounts. Because the native accounts is nothing but what? They are 
affiliated to a king they are affiliated to the king you won't believe many many rulers in indian scholars are actually even though there is necessity nor necessity they are always indulged in the praising the king you are this you are that why because if you praise the king king will give you land donations gold or some kind of house everything they will provide so our scholars are majorly indulging in the praising the kings there that means what whatever the kings negativities whatever is the reality in the society they never exposed because if you are exposing the negativity nothing but what you are criticizing the king's rule so that means what our native rulers our native scholars always affiliated to the king and they are in a job of always praising the king because obviously there is a need if you praise the king obviously you will get the promotion you will get the money you will get the land donations land record i mean land charters you will get the land villages so that's what that is the reason but whereas the foreign scholars has no having such a kind of necessity because they are foreigners even though they praise the king they are not praise the king it is nothing matter because according to hindu dharma shastra a atidhi is equal to deva atidhi devo bhava even if he enter into your territory even if you criticizes you even he is not caring you it is your duty to respect him to provide the whatever the necessity so in the ancient days or medieval days the dharma shastras are respected very much so even though foreign scholars are actually regarding the original content regarding the sati regarding the things of no this kind of ruler is a cruel ruler is taxing even the birth tax even though the kings are respected them did you ever come across a ruler killing a foreigner many foreign scholars are mentioning about the untouchability sati but in this entire history of indian history did you come across a scholar i mean to say a popular ruler killing a foreigner i mean to say scholar who came to visit his court no you you even not noticed also i'm not talking about the war because war obviously you have to kill him i'm talking about the scholar who visited his court as a guest so that is the reason the foreign scholars the foreign records are much more reliable than reliable than the native accounts because they don't have the need to praise the king okay because they don't get anything written and that too even though they records the negative negative society of the life new to things of the rulers also they are not even get any harmful kind of things because they are respected that is the reason foreign accounts are much more reliable than the native accounts because they are the foreigners their complete indian society is completely different to them so whatever the thing they are astonished surprised found new they recorded in the history that is the reason you will get the much more societal cultural information from the foreign accounts because the foreign accounts are unbiased a king is there and his scholar is recording something definitely he will show some partisanship he will show some favoritism to him he will show some biased thing towards the king because his duty is to praise the king in return he will get something written back so that is the reason the native accounts are not much reliable but the foreign accounts are much reliable trustworthy and unbiased and more importantly they served as the primary source they served as the primary source okay so the foreign accounts are much reliable trustworthy unbiased actually two three times asked main, mains question this is okay what is the i mean to say comparatively whether you believe uh, comparatively which source are more reliable for the to study history indigenous accounts or foreign accounts so foreign accounts are much reliable because they are much trustworthy unbiased that is the reason they are primary source of information to study about the indian history please sir uh, there is also this argument Hmm. 
from other travel rewards. Hmm. So there could be a very high chance hmm. that the travelers, especially who didn't travel the entire country like the Chinese travelers, hmm. who made it a point to travel the entire country and then write the record, but many of these weekend Latin travel like uh, envoys just stayed in the capital in the court. Hmm. So their understanding of the country hmm. is not necessarily through groundwork hmm. but through sitting at court. Hmm. So they just write what they are fed. Hmm. And what they are fed is obviously biased. Hmm. So in that sense, if they did not do the entire country traveling like say hmm. the Chinese travelers of it, hmm. even their accounts could be affiliated to the king indirectly, right? Hmm. So the point is this is comparison more when re reliable upon the sources what is indigenous accounts more reliable foreign accounts are more reliable foreign accounts are comparatively more reliable frankly speaking if you merit the both things foreign accounts will be this much useful and native accounts are not even useful also if you see a person whose name is fahin who visited the court of chandra gupta too he toured entire india from Punjab, in the Pakistan Punjab to he even visited the Bangladesh kind of territory, West Bengal area. From East to West, entire India, he toured. He is the first foreigner who recorded the untouchability. Even the dietary habits, the Dalit people, the low class people are eating the garlic. The upper class people not even touching the garlic. Okay, each and every social cultural conditions are he depicted very well. Okay, regarding the untouchability, regarding the position of women, women is not allowed to study. Women do not have the property rights. Women are performing a very, very different kind of thing known as sati. So, this kind of valuable information is given by the Fahin by touring entire North India. If you see It Singh, who is also a Chinese traveler, who visited the court of both Harshavardhana, Guptans and other regional rulers also. He even visited Nalanda University. He even visited the entire tour to North India. Okay, so these people toured India. If Megasthenes, you are asking, Megasthenes is a tour to not only North India, but there is accounts that he even came to Amaravati. Because according to him, Amaravati, the, the popularly known as during the time Dharani Kota, he mentioned about the Buddhist Nagarjuna University. According to him, he is the only person who mentioned about the Buddhist Nagarjuna University that is the first Buddhist university in the world because of Indica. Okay, even foreign accounts are consisting of, you know, negatives because they don't know the society. Megasthenes Indica says there are seven castes in India. Actually, there is only four Varnas. Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya and Shudra. Untouchables are not a caste. They are outcast. So, because he don't know what is Varna. He is a foreigner. He suddenly visited India. Entire society is divided into four types. But he don't know what is Varna. So, he mentioned that there are seven castes in India. He mentioned that there is no famines in India. But in his period, Chandragupta, Maurya period, there is severe famine. Almost entire North India is under the very, very severe drought. The own Chandragupta Maurya, who belongs to Mauryan dynasty, left to the throne and he came to south, settled in Sravana, Belagola, and taken the Digambara Jainism and left there and died there by performing Sallekana. That is also blunder. But he says what? There is no famines in India. So that means what? Even foreign accounts consisting of such a loopholes. But Indian accounts are very much loopholes. Got it, right? Indians are, many, many Indian scholars are actually, I will tell you, the first historiographer in India is in the 11th century AD, whose name is Kalahana. 11th century AD lo Kalahana Raja Tarangani Rasadu, that Kalahana is the first historiographer in India. Indians exposed their scientific outlook in grammar, mass, science, Gravity, Astrology, Astronomy, everything, Algebra, everything they exposed, but they failed to produce a single historian up to 11th to 12th century. 12th century, AD Varaku, one historian led India. Even also local history. I am talking about Indian scholar. Kalahana, 12th century, AD, 11th century, AD, whose name is Kalahana, is the first historiographer in India. Until then, nobody wrote about history in a clear-cut, organized way, in a systematic way. That is the position of India. No historian produced. Indian says that and this, but there is no historiographer. 
Indians don't know how to write history. Openly says. That is the reason up to 12th, 11th century, Kalahana is the first historiographer in India. But father of history, Herodotus, wrote regarding the history sitting in the Greek in BC. But Indians not even produced a single historians. Because they don't worry about the history. Because history, according to them, what? Praising the kings. Praising everything. There is a court scholar called Bhana under Harsha Charita. Harsha Charita not even done one thing for the society, but the point is what? He done just for the welfare activities in a small way. Not even comparable with Ashoka. But Bana took the Harsha celestial heights. He literally projected as the God. Whatever the scenes you are seeing now, that means in the Bahubali, in the movies, is actually the image, is actually written by the Bana in his Harsha Charita. Harsha Charita is nothing but returning about his own ruler, that is Harsha. Silly thing mentioned as a great thing. Everything is, not only his, everybody in the Indian scholars are majorly worried about his own scholar. Samudra Gupta scholars, Chandra Gupta two scholars consisting of Navaratnas, prizing king. Not even though there is no relevance, but they are prizing, they are in illness. But no scholar, you won't even, be, I will give you a classic example for this. I told you Fahin, who wrote Fagozi, who visited the court of Chandra Gupta too. He lived in the court. He stayed in India for 10 years. He lived in the court of Chandra Gupta too, one of the greatest ruler of Gupta dynasty. But he not even mentioned a single line about Chandra Gupta too. He is not even mentioned a single line regarding the Chandra Gupta too, in which period he lived in the court. So that is the authenticity. That is the first hand information given by the foreigners. I will tell you a very, very cla classic example regarding this issue. You will definitely get convinced. Regarding the Alexander invaded India, everybody is know. You won't believe. No Indian scholar given the information regarding the Alexander invasion in India. We came to know about the Alexander invasion in India just because of the foreign scholars. Foreign scholars, if there is no foreign scholars, Definitely Indians might have don't know about the Alexander invasion because Indians never accept the negativity. Okay, I think in 2017 means a mains question. Indians are hypocrites. Question is Indians are hypocrites. That means they never accept their loopholes. Pakkodi loophole guru smaaladud. Ni loopholes na accept jeev. Always praising the me me di me me di ani never accept the loopholes. I told you, why Indians never mentioned about Alexander invasion? Because Indians are defeated by the Alexander. That is the point. That is the reason no Indian scholar mentioned about the Alexander invasion. Because Alexander is victorious by defeating the Indian rulers. That is the reason no single scholar mentioned about the Alexander invasion in India. We came to know by the only by the foreign scholars about the Alexander invasion. If there is no foreign accounts, seriously speaking, we definitely don't know about the Alexander invasion. Because our scholars are only obsessed with the greatness. They never ever cared about the society. They never ever. So if somebody, there is a scholar called in the 11th century, whose name is actually Feradosi. I mean to say Feradosi. Okay, so there are many Central Asian scholars came. When they came to see India, they shocked. They shocked to see the knowledge of the Brahmanas. Because knowledge, the knowledge of the Brahmanas is astonished by the, the foreigners. That means they have the knowledge regarding the mass, science, grammar, astrology, astronomy, gravity, even plastic surgery. But when they ask you regarding the sharing the information, you give something, I have mass regarding this, you take something, but they neglected. They even say Mlecha, get well. I mean to say you get off. Mlecha is nothing but the foreigners. The foreigners are treated as untouchables in India. They never ever giving the access to the Brahmanas education, Brahmanas books. Okay, so that is the scenario. The never saw, the Indian knowledge are insulators. Insular attitude mentality are Indians. That means they never ever share their knowledge to the others. Indian Indians somebody in India. okay, at least they will do not think. They will try to retaliate in a written way. 
అగ్రెసివ్గా చెప్తారు కానీ అరే తప్ప రైటా నో బడి నో బడి వరీడ్ అబౌట్ ద ద సేమ్ ఈజ్ డిపిక్టెడ్ ఇన్ ద నేటివ్ స్కాలర్స్ ఓకే ద సేమ్ ఈజ్ డిపిక్టెడ్ ఇన్ ద నేటివ్ స్కాలర్స్ సో దట్ ఈస్ ద రీజన్ రైట్ ఆన్ ద ఫారిన్ అకౌంట్స్ ఆర్ మోర్ రిలేబుల్ దెన్ ద ఇండిజినస్ అకౌంట్స్ రైట్ ఆన్ వి కేమ్ టు నో అబౌట్ ద we came to know we came to know we means what indians came to know about the alexander invasion we came to know about the alexander invasion by the foreign scholars no indian scholar no indian scholar mentioned about the mentioned about the alexander invasion in india alexander invasion in india okay so there are loopholes in the foreign scholars but comparatively there are much less loopholes comparatively need to accounts i told you just now alberuni the central asian scholar alberuni alberuni is very much indologist that means who worried about the indian history and all he came from central asia and he is shocked by the indian knowledge and all and he asked to share the knowledge about the brahmanas nobody is dare to share the knowledge and even he expelled from the houses you are a mlecha that is your untouchable you don't know you won't believe that he learned sanskrit in order to know the indian information and he even wrote the books in sanskrit why he learned sanskrit is he is not curious about sanskrit because he want to know the knowledge he want to know the knowledge about the indians and many of the science knowledge is stored in which language sanskrit language whatever the science whatever the maths whatever the society each and everything is you know compiled in sanskrit language but the people are not sharing their language everything is compiled in sanskrit what he did he stayed in india for 10 long years okay even though his ruler is left he came with the ruler to, who invaded india and he left india the ruler left india but he dared to stay in india because he is very much curious about the indian science maths grammar dramas kavyas so that is the reason he in- intentionally learned sanskrit and he became the scholar in sanskrit and he himself wrote books in sanskrit because brahmanas are not share their knowledge that is the point so that is the insular attitude of indians it is not mentioned by it is mentioned by the alberuni himself okay we will come to we will study about him in the medieval ages in the muslim invasions okay